Ministries at Evangelical Free Church in Fullerton, California. He has written over six books. He has received several awards for the books that he has written. He serves on quite a few boards, including the Marble Retreat Center, uh, the AACC. Uh, he is a father, a grandfather. Uh, his daughter and uh, son-in-law are serving right now in Turkey. Uh, as a matter of fact, as uh, missionaries. And so he has a heart and passion for missions. Uh, when I first called him and I said, I introduced myself and I said, uh, this is uh, Gary Zustiak. We're from a, a small Christian college in Joplin, Missouri, titled Ozark Christian College. He says, I know Ozark. And I'm like, what'd you say, Willis? You know, how, how do you know about Ozark? I mean, you know, and he said, well, I'm a graduate of Calvary Bible College. I played Ozark when I was on the basketball team. And so I thought, well, this would be kind of a cool uh, uh, return back. And so we are just very privileged to have uh, uh, Dave Carter here to uh, share with us today in chapel. Uh, he also has very graciously said at noon... Uh, he's just going to go down to the cafeteria, and if you guys want to choose a big table and you want to just sit and shoot questions at him uh, about anything having to do with the area of counseling and, uh, you know, ministry, he's going to be there from uh, 1230 to 130. And so if you just want to go down to the cafeteria, just get your lunch and sit at a table with Dave, he's very gracious to uh, do that. Also, today at 230... In L15, we're having a very special uh, seminar entitled Close Calls and want to invite everyone to that. This is uh, How to Protect Your Marriage. Uh, he has a book by that very same title, Close Calls, and uh, there's no charge for this seminar. And even though most of you aren't married yet, I know you want to be. All right, because I've heard your conversations. I've seen you steal the looks at that guy or that girl in class. So really what you want to do is you want to know how to build a strong foundation and uh, to protect godly marriages. And so without any further ado, would you give a great Ozark Christian College welcome to David Carter, please. <laughs> well... You kind of stole my thunder. I was saying I was going to come back to my roots. I actually have multiple generations of uh, my mom's family have lived in Joplin, Missouri, since the uh, late 1800s, actually. And uh, until just very recently, the last one passed away. Now, some of you in here have heard stories today. I know some of you know some of the, the, the lady that asked for the money. Boy, that's the way to do it. Show me the money, okay? So I think you did it right like it should be done. And you think to yourself, well, I came from a bad family. I mean, that's, that's where, I, where all my injury comes from. And that's why I'm so messed up. And that's why I need so much help, etc. Well, today, I'm going to tell you the story from one of the Bible's best families. Okay? The best families. The family that's held up as an example for all of us. The name is in a trilogy, and it appears throughout Scripture constantly. And I'm going to give you a chance to talk to the person you're sitting next to in this chapel service. If you don't like them, now's the time to move, okay? So you can get up and you can go to the back or go to the bathroom or get a drink or whatever you got to do, okay? Because <laughs> I'm going to give you lots of opportunity just to do that. Now, I want you to think, okay, and I want you to give me some feedback. What, out loud, what's the first descriptive word that comes to your mind as I describe this child, okay? He was born late in life, very late in life, to extremely wealthy parents, and he's the only child they had. <laughs> His name is Isaac, okay? Okay, the dynamics you have back there in family relations are exactly like the dynamics we face in the 21st century. People relate on the same levels. Furthermore, this boy Isaac was born into a blended family. Okay? He had a 13-year-old junior high half-brother who was a real pain, and you know what? All junior high kids are, okay? Nobody ever wants to go back to junior high, okay? Nobody, okay? 
Now, this junior high boy started picking on this baby brother of his for one reason. Because he knew when this boy was born, he had lost everything. Everything. He had absolutely nothing left. Now, if for 13 years you had been raised to be the heir of all the wealth in the world in that environment, and then suddenly it was taken away by this little baby boy, you know what would be going through your mind, okay? There's an easy way to get rid of this problem. And the little baby boy's mother saw it and said to her husband, get that woman out of here and get that boy out of here. I don't want him anywhere around. Now, Abraham had become so attached to this boy and to his mother that he wasn't going to do that. He wasn't going to follow his wife's commands. And so God had to step in face to face and say to Abraham, it's okay, Abraham, send him out in the desert. I'll take care of him. And he did. Okay. Now, things went on in this family pretty normal, as would happen in a very wealthy family with a mother who finally had a baby boy late in life and had all the money in the world to indulge him with. Until one day, his dad said to him, son, God's called me on a journey, called us on a journey. I'm going to take you on a journey. Now, as I tell you this story, I want you to know, I've been to seminary. I know what the Bible says. But I want you to think with me how the feelings would be, what the emotions would be in this story. Sometimes we just read the Bible like it's devoid of feeling. It's not. It's the emotional background that really gets people caught in difficulties sometimes and injures them and makes them feel so strongly about different experiences and, uh, and life journeys that they've been on. So this father and this uh, young boy, they walk on this journey, and you can just hear the anxieties building because the, I, Isaac looks up at his dad and says, Dad, you know, here's the firewood, here's the coals, where's the sacrifice? And he says, i God to provide. So they finally get to the place where the sacrifice is going to take place, and Abraham says it's here. And so Isaac, as the dutiful son, starts pitching in, picking up boulders, rocks, building an altar for his dad. He helped stack the wood on top of the altar so it'd just be a perfect fit. Still no sacrifices showed up. His dad walks over and ties his hands behind his back and pushes him up and gets him on top of the altar. Okay. And he's laying on his back, looking up into his dad's face, and he watches his dad take a knife out of his belt and hold it over his chest, ready to plunge it straight through his heart. And God steps in. Now, any time anybody faces death from a parent in the name of God, it will be extremely painful. Extremely painful. I want you to turn and talk to your friends next to you about tough emotional times you might have faced in your home, in your environment, and I'm just going to give you two minutes to do it. And if you haven't, maybe as somebody else you know, uh, you might want to talk about them. It's always safe to say, I know this person. I know a friend. I have a friend, you know. You can talk about them. I'm giving you two minutes, and then we're going to come back into this story because this is just the beginning. Go. Two minutes. <clears throat>
Okay, you're, you're going to stop early. Good, right, let's go, okay? Now, Abraham is a pretty typical dad, I think, in this journey, uh, like probably like most of us, and probably like most of you will be if you don't really work hard at being different. They never talked about it. My dad was American Indian. Um, for my high school graduation, we went on a nine-day fly fishing trip to Wyoming. My dad didn't say 10 words on the whole trip. My dad was a grunter and a pointer, okay? And I got used to that. I thought that was normal. So here's Abraham and Isaac on this journey home, and they don't talk about it. The Bible doesn't say anything. I have lots of questions. So when he finally gets home, now remember, this is a mother who has one child in a culture that really idolizes male children. So you can imagine what she had been like as a mother when he was young and growing up. Yeah. Watch out, you know, no, no football for you, you know, just, no, you, you gets too dangerous. You, 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 she was one of those kind of smother mothers, probably, you know, really <laughs> kind of making sure this one chance she has is going to live, okay? So now this boy comes back from this journey with his father, and he walks in, and he says, Mom, you'll never believe what happened out in the desert. And she he tells her the story, and she says, oh, I understand. I I've been betrayed by your dad. I know exactly what that feels like, okay? Okay? I have. Your dad was so afraid for his own life that when we visited King Abimelech, he lied and said I was his sister and let King Abimelech take me into the harem. I understand what betrayal's all about, okay? So, mom and son now have this even closer bond because they share a similar trauma, okay? Okay? Life goes on. Mom dies. He's 37 years old, Isaac is, okay? He and his mom have been like this. Some of you married ladies out there might even have married or married to a man that you feel... Oh, he and his mother, they're, they're way too close. Okay, okay, so you understand, okay? Mom dies, and for three years, the Bible's very clear that Isaac is terribly depressed. He is so depressed that his dad, after he's already gone ahead and married somebody else and started having a second family again, he goes and says to his servant, go get my, wife, my boy uh, a wife. And you all know that story of Isaac and Rebecca, okay? Now, you got to think about what it was like for Rebecca. This servant shows up 500 miles away, which is might, well, might as well have been on another planet, maybe even closer to 600 by the time they had to wander through the different dunes and everything in the desert. This man shows up, and this young girl, we don't know how old she was. Her death is never recorded in Scripture, only the fact that she was buried. Her age was never given. We assume she's probably somewhere in her teens. He shows up, and he's going to cart her 600 miles away from her mother to meet a man she's never met who is 40 years of age, and she's going to become his wife. Now, just think what that would be like, you girls. Okay, just think what that would be like emotionally. Leaving the security of your big brothers who protected you, your mom and dad's home, you're getting on a camel, you're going to ride 600 miles, and you're going to marry a man you've never met, and you'll never see your family again. So she sees this guy, Isaac, out in the field, and she jumps off the camel, and he, like, this is so great, the Bible tells these stories, and he takes her into his mother's tent and has sexual relations with her, and he married her, it says, and this is what it says. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You can't use a spouse or a marriage to heal your private family of origin pain. Okay, you can't. He tried it. It didn't work. Now, can you hear it? Listen, just listen to it. I'm going to let you talk. Just sing. Can you imagine what it would be like for Rebecca living in her mother-in-law's tent when her son cannot get over her death. Three years, okay? You can't touch that, you know. Well, mom didn't cook it that way. 
you know, you need to fix it more like this, you know? This is a teenage girl who's living with a ghost of a mother-in-law. And you know the difference between in-laws and outlaws? Outlaws are wanted. Okay? <laughs> that. Okay. Now, talk. You got two minutes about that marriage and that death and that mom attachment and everything. Go right now. You got two minutes. Go. Okay, come on back, okay? A famine comes in the land, and Isaac and Rebekah come up against the same king Abimelech, okay? And guess what Isaac does? He tells King Abimelech, this is my sister. You can have her in your harem. He did the same thing his dad did, even though he knew how painful it was to his mother. Okay, the warning, if you don't really work through whatever pain you bring to your adult life, you will repeat it. Even though you made a promise to yourself as a kid, I will never do that to my children. Okay, it doesn't just spontaneously relieve itself. You have to focus on it and work through it. Or you'll find yourself saying the same, same things, doing the same things, everything you hated as a kid, too. Because parents aren't perfect. Okay? So in this process, though, she gets out of the harem. She has no children. Uh, Isaac goes to bat for her, and uh, God answers prayer. And she has twins. And uh, you know the story. Uh, Jacob sticks his uh, hand out first. And they tie a red string around it. And then his brother Esau comes out. And then Jacob comes out holding the heel. And he gets the name Jacob Deceiver from doing that experience. And then some really interesting things begin to happen. In four verses, God tells us this. Isaac loved Esau. And Rachel, Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, why is that true? Why, why did that happen? Why did those two married people stop loving each other and start loving their children more than they love their spouses? How did that happen? They were crazy about each other when they first got married. Well, I'm going to share with you some of the dynamic. Isaac said, I don't care what God says. I'm going to love the firstborn son because that's what my culture says is important. I'm going to choose culture over Christ and make my firstborn son the most important one. And so Jacob gets stuck with mom. 
and feeling isolated from her husband because she had been betrayed by him with King Abimelech and she couldn't trust him anymore, she gravitates to this little baby boy who gives her unconditional love and they become like this. Okay. To the point that in just a few years, they conspire to kill the other boy and to steal the birthright. I mean, this is quite a conspiracy when your mother and son comes up and deceives, deceives the husband in the process. But some interesting things happen on this journey. As, they, as these two boys grow up, and as they continue to have this sibling rivalry, and as each parent has their own favorite child to kind of love, and they, don't, they stop loving each other, it teaches us an important concept. The best thing you can ever do for your children is to love their mother or love their father, okay? Because 20 years after you have them, you're going to sit across from each other in the breakfast table, and you're going to say, who in the heck is this person? because you spent 20 years focusing on your kids. And you won't know each other. And that's exactly what happens with half of American married couples. Now, it's interesting that they each chose a favorite child. Okay? There's nothing wrong with favorites. Jesus had favorites. Out of all the people in the world, Jesus chose the Jews. Out of all the Jews, he chose 12 disciples. Out of the 12 disciples, and here comes a test of your Bible knowledge. Out of the 12 disciples, he had three favorites, and their names were Peter, James, and John. We all know who the favorites are. Yeah, okay? And John was the most favorite of all, okay? In your family system is a favorite child. Okay, hang on. I'm going to give you a chance to say, okay? If you don't know who the favorite child is, it's you, Okay? <laughs> Because you think everybody in the family has had your experience, and they haven't, okay? Now, John and Jesus were favorites, not because Jesus loved John more, but because he and John just saw life alike. They felt it alike. They, they, they viewed it. They, they shared common feelings in this process, and they felt really close to it. They had this affinity, and you have a favorite in your, in your family of origin. I want you to talk about your favorite, the favorite child in your family. Go, I got, you got two minutes, go, go. Okay, okay, I gotta hurry. Now, count this fair warning. Be very careful about marrying a favorite child of somebody else's family. <laughs> they're used to high level treatment and accommodation, okay? And they're gonna expect you're gonna treat them just like the family did. And you're, you're gonna have a lot of pressure, you are, okay? 
You can do it, but just be sure you've really worked through that together before you do get married. Now, Esau, still disobeying God, calls his eldest son Esau, I mean Isaac, uh, calls Esau in, and he says, I want to bless you. Before I get old and die, I want to bless you. Uh, you know, my eyes are failing. I don't know how long I, I'm going to be in this position. And we have to kind of assume that Isaac lived about half his life blind. He died at 180, and this was probably somewhere just between 90 and 80 years of age. He blesses Esau. And he sends Esau out to get the game, cook the game he likes. This is his favorite son. This, by the way, is the son that got to do everything he couldn't do as a kid. And Isaac was living his life vicariously through his son's activities. Killing wild game, cooking it, and really fixing it up like he, he always wanted to do, but mom wouldn't let him out of the house. He hung around the tents, the Bible says. So anyway, he goes out. Mom hears this, and she says to her son, Jacob, she says, oh, we, we're going to deceive him. I'll fix it. You go get the lamb. We'll put the clothes on you. We all know that story, okay? But the Bible tells us some really great stuff. I mean, I just love the Bible, okay? <laughs> Verse 33, listen to this. In fact, Jacob gets the blessing, walks out, runs like crazy. Esau comes in shortly. The Bible says they just barely pass each other. Esau brings the game in, and Isaac says, who's this? And how'd you get the game so quick? And he said, oh, he asked Jacob that. And then he says, I just blessed him. I am your son. I'm your firstborn, Esau says. And Isaac trembled violently and said, who is it then? Now, why would the Bible put that in there? Isaac trembled violently because Isaac was having a post-traumatic stress disorder attack. He had now been betrayed by his father. He had now been abandoned by his mother. And he'd now been betrayed by his wife and son. And he had this terrible, emotional, physical reaction. If you've ever had or been through trauma and then had a reaction to it, stimulated by some noise or a similar experience, you know exactly what's going on. That's what Isaac was going on. He went through that. He understood what that was all about, to be betrayed on multiple fronts. And Esau begs for a blessing and doesn't really get much of one at all. In fact, he really almost gets a negative blessing to the point that as he walks out of the tent, he promises he's going to kill his brother. These are really, this is sibling rivalry at its highest, okay? And he chases him down, and you know the story and everything else. And then because the brothers never quite get over the sibling rivalry, they start choosing wives and trying to have babies and compete with each other. And they choose multiple wives, and the two wives compete with each other. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So I want to tell you this in closing. Your spouse that you marry, and the chances are good most of you will marry, can never fix your family of origin issues. Never. It's impossible. They cannot be your daddy and your husband and your lover at the same time. They can't be your missing mama and your wife and your lover at the same time. Okay? So you bring the cleanest slate you can to marriage. You work through all this stuff. And the reason why I shared this with you today is good families hurt each other just like bad families do, okay? And you need to take a look at what you're bringing to the table. If you're using this little girl you're dating or this guy that you just got starry-eyed for, you need to come to the workshop on infatuation that I'm gonna be doing tomorrow, I think it is, okay? Because you've got to finish this before you fall in love. They can't fix it, okay? And you'll keep repeating it. It just kind of carries on generation to generation. But God redeems, <clears throat> and he will bless your efforts to heal from it. And you've got very specific opportunities here to do that. So I want to thank you for this day, and I trust God will bless each and every one of you deeply and wholeheartedly in the future. God bless you.